contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. Written over a seven-year period, the poems evoke four places which each had a spiritual or emotional impact on Eliot. Burnt Norton is a country house in Gloucestershire which he found magical and mysterious. East Coker is the village in Somerset from which his Eliot ancestors sailed to the New World in the 17th century. The Dry Salvages returns to his childhood holidays at Cape Ann on the coast of Massachusetts. Little Gidding in Cambridgeshire was once the chapel of an Anglican community which was desecrated by Cromwell's parliamentarians during the English Civil War. I think Four Quartets does have a contemplative sense to it. And retreat is important. It's something that Eliot thought of as being very important, that you have to be able to withdraw from the noisiness of life and find um, what he would think of as the authenticity of silence. I mean, he once talked about poetry as words on a page with a lot of silence. Um, and I think it was the silence that he was often interested in, that we would arrive at that place, which is the true silence, which is not empty at all, but which is full of meaning. And for him, at least, the exact and the precise language of poetry was a way of, of calming the noisy chattering mind and allowing us to reach that place which inevitably and eventually becomes silence. Footfalls echo in the memory down the passage which we did not take towards the door we never opened into the rose garden. My words echo thus in your mind. But to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves I do not know. Ash on an old man's sleeve is all the ash the burnt roses leave. Dust in the air suspended marks the place where a story ended. Dust inbreathed was a house, the wall, the wainscot and the mouse. The death of hope and despair. This is the death of air. The last three poems were written at the height of the Second World War and were seen at the time as highly patriotic. Eliot himself was a fire warden on the roof of Faber and Faber, and the Blitz becomes the element of fire in the final poem. Water and fire succeed the town, the pasture and the weed. Water and fire deride the sacrifice that we deny. Water and fire shall rot the marred foundations we forgot of sanctuary and choir. This is the death of water and fire. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, I need your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring me condemnation, but health and mind. Throughout the war, Eliot continued to go into his office on a daily basis and to worship at St. Stephen's Church but he was still, effectively, of no fixed abode. In the course of writing four quartets, he had worked closely with the Cambridge scholar John Hayward, who advised him on their composition and helped to edit the numerous drafts. After the war, Hayward, who suffered from muscular dystrophy and was confined to a wheelchair, suggested to Eliot that they should share a large mansion flat in Chelsea, overlooking the river. In early 1946, they moved into Carlisle Mansions, where Eliot was to live for the next 11 years. Eliot used to push him round in his wheelchair and so on, on Saturdays. And I think that Eliot felt that he should help somebody in a real way who was worse off than himself. And John was a very good verbal critic he was a really good scholar. It was very important to John. There was a sort of element of ownership there. If you rang up for Tom, you couldn't be absolutely sure 
that John would pass the message on, that he had a sort of feeling that he was going to be the, the gatekeeper. In 1948, Eliot became the third British writer after Kipling and Galsworthy to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. The Swedish Academy praised his capacity to cut into the consciousness of our generation with the sharpness of a diamond. All young writers have very naturally a tendency to try and imitate the personal habits of an older author whom they admire. And I think my generation was singularly fortunate in that our hero uh, was Mr. Eliot. I don't think any of us, so far as I know, took to imitating him to the point of uh, wearing a bowler hat and carrying a tightly rolled umbrella. But at least he taught us it is not becoming to look too much like a poet. Eliot was quite simply the most celebrated writer of his day, but his domestic circumstances were hardly those of a world-famous cultural grandee. I think there must have been times when it was extremely depressing to deal with John Hayward's hang-ups. I mean, he was a very complicated man. Auden was staying here in this house. He came back from having tea with... Uh, Eliot and said, why do you pay so many games of patience? So it obviously was a very depressing time for uh, Eliot. And uh, so he said, oh, of course, it's the nearest thing to being dead. And uh, Whiston was very upset by this. Within a year of moving to Carlisle Mansions, Eliot heard that his wife Vivian had died at the age of just 58 in the hospital where she had been confined for the previous nine years. And last, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been, the shame of motives late revealed and the awareness of things ill done and done to others harm which once you took for exercise of virtue. Then fool's approval stings and honor stains. From wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds unless restored by that refining